next song we're going to sing is It Is Well. And I don't know if you've ever walked through a Hobby Lobby, but this is a phrase you see a lot on some of our decor. And I fear sometimes that it becomes this, oh, it doesn't matter what's happening. It's well. No, life is hard sometimes. It doesn't feel well. But I think we can sing it as well when we remember that we have a living hope. That we have a redeemer, a savior. Jesus has overcome the grave. Victory is won. And yes, there's trials, tribulations, tough stuff. But because this life is temporary, and we have a promise, a promise of eternity, we can sing it as well. I think you're going to notice this morning that the songs are tilted a little toward eternity. And I hope that encourages you as we sing this morning.
Before we go to prayer, I just want to mention that our missionaries of the month for June are Gary and Debbie Baxter. And Gary has several speaking engagements coming up this summer, and he just wanted to ask that we would pray for him, that those would be really fruitful uh, kinds of ministry. So let's join our hearts and go to the Lord together in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the hope of heaven, for the hope of everlasting life that we have because of Jesus Christ. Lord, we think about the, uh, the whole future that we have, the eternal future that we have, of being in your presence, seeing you face to face, getting to experience your love in all of its fullness, getting to gaze upon your glory and your beauty and your majesty. Getting to be in a place where the glory of the Lord fills the earth as the waters cover the sea. Lord, it is overwhelming to think about how amazing and how wonderful it's going to be to be with you forever. And so, Father, we thank you for that hope that's ours because of Jesus. I pray that you would help us to know what is the hope of our calling, Lord. That we would see more and more clearly the hope that we have in Christ. And, and Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come soon. Lord, we look forward to that day that we get to see you face to face. We long for you to bring your kingdom in all of its fullness. And so we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And Father, it is truly amazing that we have this glorious hope, all because of what you've done for us through Christ. Because of your mercy, because of your grace, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you so much for coming into this world being born, living a, a challenging, difficult life of suffering, and giving your life on a cross, and then rising from the dead, all so that we could have this hope of eternal life. Oh, Lord Jesus, what amazing mercy is yours. Thank you that because of your death and resurrection, that our sin is forgiven through faith in you, and that we stand righteous before the Lord, righteous and holy and pure and clean in the sight of the Father. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace and for your righteousness that covers us. Thank you, Father, that we are accepted in your presence and accepted as your children, but that we are accepted in, into eternal life because of your mercy. Lord, we don't deserve this at all, and so we just rejoice in the grace of the gospel this morning. And we want to pray this morning, Father, that, that the gospel would spread throughout the entire earth, Lord. We long for the truth of Jesus Christ and for the hope that's found in Him, for this good news to be spread to those who have never heard. Lord, there are so many people in this world in ignorance. They've never heard of Jesus. They've never heard the good news. And so we pray that you would raise up more and more people to take the truth of the gospel to those who are unreached, that you would send out more and more laborers into your harvest field, Father, so that people could hear this good news, that they would come to to know that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. We pray that those who have never heard of him will see, and that those who have never heard will understand. And Father, as, as that happens, as the gospel advances into, into new frontiers among the unreached peoples, we pray that many, many people who hear the gospel would respond in faith, Lord. And so we pray that you would remove unbelieving hearts of stone, and that you would replace them with believing hearts of flesh. Lord, that you would put your Holy Spirit into people and cause them to, to repent and to believe, and that you would bring them from death to life. Father, we lift up Terry Baxter to you as he has several opportunities to, to share the good news throughout the summer. And we pray that through his ministry that many, many people would come to put their faith in Christ and be saved, Lord. So may your Spirit's anointing and empowerment be upon Terry as he travels and preaches this summer, Lord. And then, Father, as we think of some of our own needs as a church family, we want to pray for continued healing for, for Don Moore <coughs> as he recovers from his illness over at the Concord Care Center. Be near to him and be near to Daria because she's at home. And, Father, we lift up Elizabeth Baxter to you and, um, as she is going to have her baby very soon. And also, also Daniel Dextra as she's going to have her baby soon. And we pray that their deliveries will go very, very well and that their babies would be healthy and and strong, and that you would just bless these next days now for both of those families. And as we continue to worship now, Father, 
We pray that you would help us to just focus our hearts upon your son Jesus and upon the grace that you've given us in Jesus. Lord, would you open up our hearts to see more of you and would you help us to re joyfully respond to your glory and your grace by worshiping you with joyful and glad hearts. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. A few um, announcements uh, this morning. Um, first of all, uh, two weeks from today is Father's Day, and we are hoping to have a child dedication uh, that day. And so if you have any children uh, that haven't been dedicated to the Lord and you'd like to do that, um, you can let me know. My email address is there in the bulletin, and we would love to do that on, on Father's Day. It just as a way to celebrate Father's Day as a church family. Vacation Bible School is coming up in July, um, and so parents, you can put that on your calendar starting July 21st, going through the 25th, then you can register your, your kids for, for VBS. We'd appreciate that so we know how many kids to plan for. And then also, um, if you on your way out today, if you could um, stop in, in the entryway and look in the lost and found and see if anything there belongs to you, we'd appreciate that because everything that's not taken in the next couple weeks will be removed um, after a couple weeks. Um, one, a couple things that I should mention that are not in the bulletin this week. Um, Elizabeth Baxter is scheduled to go in uh, tonight uh, to be induced and to have her baby. And so you can just be praying for Elizabeth. Um, and Renee Quant is going to be filling in this summer uh, as our church secretary uh, with Elizabeth taking some time, um, obviously, with her, with her baby being born. And so over the next um, couple months, if you've got any... Um, Anything that you need to communicate to the church secretary, Renee will be happily filling that position, and you can um, you can email her or give her a call, and she'd love to uh, to serve you in that way. Um, a couple new uh, times for the youth group meetings. First of all, um, for the fifth through eighth grade kids, we're not going to have a fifth and sixth grade group and a seventh and an eighth. We're just going to combine them, and so the fifth through eighth grade group will be meeting on Wednesday nights from six to seven thirty here at church. That's going to start this Wednesday, and so if you have any kids that are even going into 5th grade all the way through 8th grade, um, they're welcome to come here Wednesday night at 6. Also, the senior high youth group is still going to be meeting on Sunday nights, but they're going to just meet a half an hour earlier at 6 o'clock. And this summer they're going to be meeting at uh, Pastor Nathan's house um, over on 5th Street. And so if you've got any kids uh, in ninth through 12th grade, they're welcome to come to Pastor Nathan's house at 6 o'clock tonight and every Sunday night throughout the summer. Also, one thing that Pastor Nathan is going to try to do with that is to provide meals for the kids so that they can have supper together and, and, uh, and then study the Bible together. And if, there's, if there are any of you that are interested in providing a meal once in a while, even if it's once every month or once every two months, for that youth group gathering, um, please talk to Pastor Nathan. He would really appreciate that. So... With that said, uh, let's just take a moment and stand together and we will greet one another.
God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. Once again, all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, worship team. We're going to continue to worship as we collect our morning tithes and offerings. What a good, good father we have. Would you sing with me? You're a good, good father. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And then hear God's word from 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 1 through 8 again uh, this morning, focusing on verses 5 through 7. I want to read the, read the whole context. Um, so the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands, without anger or quarreling. Let's pray together once more. Father, we're thankful for your holy and precious word. Thank you for all that it teaches us about you and about your plan. And so, Lord, as, as we look into this passage of Scripture, I, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and that you would give us a, a deeper desire and a deeper passion to see your name glorified and to see people reached with the gospel, Lord. We want to be a people who share your heart 
and who share your passion. And so, would you speak to us now and move in our hearts through your spirit and through your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. When you read the Apostle Paul's letters, and you read about his life in the book of Acts, you see very clearly that this man had a, had a great passion for spreading the gospel. I want to know, where did that passion come from? And can you and I have that same passion that Paul did? This text in 1 Timothy 2 shows us that much of Paul's passion for spreading the kingdom of God was driven by some of the most basic and central truths of Christianity. Paul is teaching us here in, in this passage to pray for people to be one to Christ. We saw that last week. Uh, that was the focus of last Sunday's message as we looked at the first four verses here in chapter 2 and then a little bit of, of verse 8. Paul wants us to pray for, for people everywhere to be one to Christ. And now in verses 5 through 7, which we're going to focus on this morning, he's going to try to persuade us to pray that way by reminding us of some of the most foundational truths that we believe. Paul is going to remind us of essentially three things in this passage. First of all, there is one God. Secondly, there is one mediator, one savior. And then thirdly, God has one mission. Now, I, I, I realize that <clears throat> these are probably things that we all know. But when Paul looked at these basic truths in the light of God's plan of salvation, they ignited a passion in his heart for the spread of the gospel. And so, this morning, what I want to do is to look at these three central truths in light of God's plan of salvation. The main point of this passage is, is verse 1, where Paul writes, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. And you know what? We will pray for all people. We will pray earnestly for all people when we share God's passion for the spread of His kingdom. And so let's look into God's Word now and allow these foundational truths that we believe to fan the flame of our passion for the spread of the gospel. And so first of all, Paul reminds us at the beginning of verse 5, for there is one God. This is maybe the most basic truth of all. <laughs> there are not multiple gods. There are not zero gods like atheists believe. But there is one and only one God. This truth is so foundational that it runs through the entire Bible, from the beginning all the way to the end. For example, back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, four says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, you might ask, what does that have to do with the spread of the gospel? We all believe there's only one God. We're not atheists here. We're not polytheists who worship many gods. We know that there's one God. What does this have to do with spreading the gospel? What does it have to do with praying for people everywhere to come to faith in Christ? Well, to answer that question, let me just point to another passage where Paul makes the same statement that there is one God. In Romans 3, verses 28 through 30, Paul writes, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. There it is, God is one. Who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. In that passage in Romans 3, Paul is teaching that we are justified through faith alone in Christ alone. And the point in that passage is that there's not one way of salvation for Jews and another way of salvation for Gentiles. You know, the one God is the God over the Jews, and He's the God over the Gentiles, and He offers salvation to everyone if they will put their faith in Christ. And so the fact that there's one God tells us that this one God created everyone, He rules over everyone, and he offers salvation through faith in Christ to everyone. This is amazing. Because if you think about it, the one God who created us all, who rules over us all, he didn't need to offer eternal life to everyone that he made. Just compare this with what Islam teaches about God, for example. Muslims believe that there is one God. They're not polytheists. They're not atheists. They believe there's one God. They call him Allah. But Allah does not care a whole lot at all about saving people from sin. You could describe Allah in, in Muslim thought as a powerful God. You could describe him as a, as a God with authority. 
But you would never describe him as a God of salvation. In contrast to that, the true and living God, the God of the Bible, the God who has revealed himself in his son Jesus, he is a God of salvation. Look at verse 4. It says that God our Savior desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The heart of God is overflowing with mercy and grace. He's not only powerful, he not only has all the authority, but he is a good God. He is a life-giving God. He is a sinner-rescuing God. And if you think about it, it really would have been perfectly just for God to just desire for all of us to be destroyed. I mean, we've all rebelled against Him. We've lived for ourselves instead of living for God. We've given our hearts to all sorts of other things instead of giving our hearts to God. <clears throat> it would have been perfectly just for Him to desire our destruction. Or, if you think about it, if God wanted to, He could just, you know, enjoy the glory of heaven, enjoy being worshipped by all the angels, and just not bother with all of us human beings down here on planet Earth. He, he could just say, I'm not going to bother with the mess that they've made of, of my world. But you know what? God does not desire our destruction. He's not willing to just leave us alone and forget about us. No, He desires our salvation because He is good. Because He is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That's who He is. And so, it's God's very nature that makes Him passionate about the salvation of sinners. If that's who God is, then shouldn't you and I share in that same passion? Just think about something that really matters to you. Maybe it's really important for you to be an honest person. Or it's really important for you to respect other people. Or to be a loyal friend. Or maybe it's really important for you to help people that are in need. If your children grow up to not really care about those things that are really important to you, isn't that going to just break your heart to see that happen? I mean, if, if your children grow up to say, I know that my mom and dad are, are really passionate about you know, being, living an honest life of integrity and respecting other people, but you know what? It doesn't really matter a whole lot to me. I'm just going to lie and cheat and steal. and I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. That would just break your heart to see that happen, wouldn't it? Our Father in Heaven is passionate about saving lost people. He loves lost sinners so much that He gave His Son to die for us. This matters to our Heavenly Father. And if we don't share our Father's passion, I can't help but think that that must break His heart. God's children, who have been saved by His grace, are meant to share our Father's heart for the lost world. And so that's one reason why we should pray for all people, as verse 1 tells us. We should pray for their salvation because there is one God... And when His passion becomes our passion, then we will pray for the salvation of the nations. But there's another reason, I think, why, why the fact that there is one God should lead us to pray for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just a couple minutes ago, I mentioned Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But do you know what the next verse calls us to do? It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Do you see the logic there? <laughs> There's one God, therefore, love Him. Be completely devoted to Him. Worship Him with all your heart. Now, if there's one God who's the creator of everyone, He's the king over everyone, then that means that He deserves the worship of everyone. He deserves the love of everyone that He's created. And this is exactly the point that God Himself makes in Isaiah 45. Listen to these verses from the end of Isaiah chapter 45. God says, And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. So there it is. There is one God. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. He's saying, the Lord alone is God, there is no other. Therefore, every knee will one day bow before Him in worship. And so, if we love God, then we should desire for everyone else to turn to Him 
and to be saved and to become worshipers of God because he is worthy of the worship of all the nations. And really, if you think about it, if you enjoy worshiping God, if, if we delight in Him, if we enjoy praising Him, then shouldn't we want everyone else that we know and everyone else really in the world to share in that same joy? I mean, think about it. When you have a baby, or if your wife has, has a baby, or if you have a new grandchild, why do you take pictures of that little baby and send, them, send those pictures to everybody that you know and post them all over social media and tell everybody that you can think of about this new little baby. It's because you adore that little child. Because your heart delights in that baby. And you want everyone that you know to have the joy of adoring that little baby with you. If we adore the living God, if our hearts find the life, if we love to worship Him, then shouldn't we want everybody else to join us in worshiping Him? And shouldn't we desire everyone to join us in seeing how spectacular He is? And for them to praise Him along with us, and to delight in Him, and to worship Him with us. And so let's pray for that to happen. Let's pray for God to, to move in the hearts of the people that we know, and who are lost, so that they can be saved, and so that they can become worshipers of God. Let's pray for God to move among the nations of the world so that He will be glorified in the joyful worship of the nations. Let's pray like the psalmist in Psalm 67. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. That's what we want to see happen. That the nations, the peoples of the earth, would find salvation in Christ and become glad-hearted worshipers of God. Not people who are saying, oh, I, I guess I'll worship God because that's what I'm supposed to do. But no, they find Christ, they found salvation in their hearts, rejoice, and they say, yes, Lord Jesus, you're my Savior, you're my Lord. I rejoice and I worship you because you're my Savior. So let's pray for the spread of the gospel in our neighborhoods and among the nations so that people be, would be one to Christ and become his worshipers. And so the first reason for us to pray for countless people to come to salvation and to come to the knowledge of the truth is that there is one God and He delights to save sinners and He is worthy. He's worthy of all of the nation, all of the worship of all of the people in this world. Now the second reason that Paul gives us to, to pray for all people is found in the second part of verse 5. Paul writes that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, what does it mean to say that Jesus is a mediator? That he's the one mediator between God and men? Well, if we need a mediator between ourselves and God, then there, that must mean that there's a broken relationship between ourselves and our Creator. Think of a person who settles legal disputes between two people. Or a person who helps two other people who are enemies to become friends again. That's what a mediator does. So why would we need a mediator between ourselves and God? It's not because God did anything wrong. It's because we ourselves have broken that relationship with God, with our sin. We need a mediator to reconcile us to God and to restore that relationship with God that's been broken because of our sin. I should mention here that this really reminds us that salvation is really ultimately about knowing God. Salvation is not only about being rescued from hell. It's not only about getting to live forever in a wonderful place. Uh, those things, of course, are incredibly important parts of our salvation. But most of all, salvation is about being reconciled to God. Being able to op enjoy a relationship with our Creator. Getting to become God's children, loved by Him. God's children who love Him and who get to spend eternity in His presence. Rejoicing in Him, rejoicing in His goodness, seeing His face, having fellowship with Jesus Christ forever. And so, <clears throat> Jesus is the one mediator who is able to restore our relationship with God. He can take prodigals like us who have run far away from God and make us welcome in God's family as His children. 
There's not one mediator for Jews and a different mediator for Gentiles. There's not one mediator for men and a different mediator for women. No, there's only one mediator, and that's the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, that truth, that there's only one mediator, has got huge implications, a number of huge implications. And one of the most important implications, um, if, I, if I can say it this way, is really not very popular at all today. It can get you in a lot of trouble, actually, if you say it publicly, <laughs> which we must say it publicly, because we're called to share the gospel. Here's what I mean. In the 21st century in the United States, the majority of non-Christians believe that there are many different paths to God. They believe that you can find God, you can get to heaven on whatever path you choose. It's called religious pluralism. It's the name for that belief. So many people, so many millions of people believe that today. Turn on the, turn on the television, you'll see that everywhere. Paul is telling us, no, 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 no. There is one way to God, and it's Jesus. Muhammad cannot be your mediator. Buddha cannot be your mediator. Neither can anyone else except for Jesus. Jesus himself is the one who made this claim. John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so, in a very important way, the gospel is exclusive. Salvation is found exclusively in Jesus Christ and in no one else. You know why? Because no one else has the power to save. No one else died for our sins. No one else can claim to be the Son of God who made a sacrifice for sinners. But the gospel, and it tells us that salvation is found exclusively in Christ, but it also tells us that Jesus came to save Jews and Gentiles, he came to save men and women, he came to save rich and poor, he came to save people in Iowa, people in Peru, people in India, people in China, he came to pe save people from all of the nations. There's no restriction based on who you are or, or where you live or how much money you have or what social class you are. The gospel is good news for everybody. Everyone who will turn to Jesus in faith. And so, the fact that there's only one mediator means that salvation can only be found in Christ. And it also means that salvation is available to anyone who will turn to Christ in faith. And so, we should ask now, what did Jesus do as our mediator? What has Jesus done to actually restore our broken relationship with God? And the answer is found in verse 6. It says that Christ Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. The way that Jesus has reconciled us to God is by giving his life as a ransom. Now what does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus gave his life as a ransom? Well, imagine for a moment if you were under a death sentence because of some crime that you had committed. I know that none of you would ever do that. <laughs> but just imagine for a moment that you're sitting on death row. You know that soon the day is going to come that, that you're going to be executed. And you fully expect to die. You have no hope of, of, of living. You've lost all of your appeals in court and the day is coming soon. And then some kind and generous man comes. And he pays an enormous price for you, for your life to be spared. And you're let out of prison, and now you're free, and you're alive. He paid, that would mean that he paid the ransom price to set you free from death. That is exactly what Jesus has done for us. Because of our sin, we were under a, a death sentence. We were on our way to eternity in hell. We had no hope of escaping that sentence. And Jesus came and he paid the ransom price to set us free. He didn't just pay an enormous amount of money, he gave his very own life to pay our ransom. If you can say it this, this way, and this is absolutely biblical, Jesus died as our substitute. We were the ones who deserved to die, and he died instead of us, in our place, as our substitute. He gave his own life so that we could be free, so that we could be redeemed, so that we could know Him personally, so that we could be alive, so that we could have everlasting life. And so if, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ personally, I, I just want to tell you that He is willing to give you this life. You can be free, you can have everlasting life if you will trust in Jesus, that He paid your ransom, 
that he gave his life to save you from your sin. If you'll embrace him by faith as your Savior. And so Paul is telling us here that, that Christ Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. In other words, he didn't just give himself to ransom one ethnic group or one social class, but he gave himself to ransom people from all the, the peoples, from all the nations of the earth. In fact, this is what they're praising Jesus for in heaven right now. In Revelation 5, as John gets to, to gaze into heaven, he sees that they're, they're standing around the throne of Jesus Christ, and they're singing to him, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. It's the very same language. Jesus died to ransom people out of all the tribes and languages. Jesus suffered and died so that ultimately, not just one people group, or not just a hundred, or not just a thousand, but all of the fifteen or sixteen thousand people groups in the world could be reached with the gospel. He suffered and died so that at least some people from every tribe, language, people, and nation could hear the gospel and believe the gospel and have eternal life. Do you see why it's so important to pray for all of the nations to be reached with the good news of salvation? This is what Jesus died to accomplish. If you can think about it this way, Jesus is going to be rewarded ultimately for his suffering. The reward that he will receive for giving his life on the cross is going to be a people gathered in from all the nations, saved by His grace, to be His bride, to be His, to, to, to love Him, to worship Him forever. Last week I mentioned a 100-year-long prayer meeting that began in the early 18th century at a place in Europe called Herrenhut. There were two young men from Herrenhut who had a burning passion to reach the slaves in the West Indies. There was one island in particular, the West Indies, that had about 3,000 slaves that lived there. They had been kidnapped in Africa, they had been brought to that island, and they were working there uh, in the sugarcane fields. And the man who owned that island absolutely hated Christianity. He hated Christians, he hated missionaries, he was an atheist, and he said that the only way that any missionaries could ever come to his island is if they sold, himself, sold themselves into slavery. To work for him in the sugarcane fields with the slaves. And these two men, young men got into a boat to sail across the Atlantic to this very island, fully expecting that they would spend the rest of their lives as slaves in the hope of sharing the gospel with these 3,000 lost souls. <coughs> and as the ship was leaving the port, and their family and friends were standing on shore waving goodbye, weeping. These two men cried out, May the Lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. That's the passion that, that led them to give their lives for the salvation of the lost nations. They knew that Jesus is the Lamb who was slain for them, the Lamb that was slain, the lamb that was slain to redeem people from the West Indies, slaves who had been captured. And they said, We want Jesus to receive the reward of his suffering. We want people to be one, become part of his bride, and worship him forever. Jesus Christ is worthy. He is worthy of being worshipped by all the nations. The mediator who died to pay our ransom is worthy of being proclaimed to the ends of the earth and worshipped by every tribe, language, and people, and nation. And so will you pray, brothers and sisters? As Paul says in verse 1, will you pray for the gospel to spread throughout the earth? Will you pray for the unreached people groups to be reached? Will you pray that God would give you a passion for the nations and that you would come to share His heart, His heart of compassion for the lost? And, I should say, if God calls, will you go and spread the gospel to the nations? That's what Paul did, and that's what verse 7 is going to tell us about. Verse 7 says, For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. God not only desires people everywhere to be saved, He not only has made a way for people everywhere to be saved through the death of Christ, 
But he even sends out people like Paul to go everywhere and to tell people how to be saved. That's what he did, of course, in Paul's life. He sent them out as a, as a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher to the Gentiles. Remember, of course, that when Paul was converted to Christ, almost all of the Christians at that point in time were, were Jewish. And they were spreading the gospel among the Jews. But Jesus specifically called Paul to go and spread the gospel among the, the Gentiles, to bring the good news of, of salvation to, to people in faraway lands so that the gospel could begin to spread throughout the earth. Paul himself talks about this calling several times in his letters. For example, in Ephesians 3, 8, he says, To me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And where did, where did Paul get that idea from? Did he just say, well, I think it would be a good idea to go to the Gentiles? Well, no. Jesus himself is the one whose plan this is. After Jesus rose from the dead, he told his disciples in Luke 24, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. This is Jesus' plan, isn't it? You know the Great Commission. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. You can't read the New Testament without seeing that God is passionate about sending on his people to spread the gospel throughout the world. And so let's think about what we've seen in this text. First of all, we've seen the most basic truth of all, that there is one God, and His heart toward the people that He created is for their salvation. We've also seen that this God is worthy of being worshipped by everyone. We've also seen that Jesus is the only way of salvation, the only mediator between God and men, and He died to ransom people for God, from every, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And on top of that, God sends out people like Paul, people like countless others, to deliver this good news to people everywhere so they can hear and believe and be saved. And so how should all of this impact us? How should these very central truths of Christianity impact our lives? Let me mention four things, just very briefly. First of all, let's share God's heart. Let's ask God to give us His heart of compassion. Would you ask God to fill you with His passion for His name to be exalted in the all the earth? I mean, think about, think about those men who, who went to reach the slaves in the West Indies, who said, may the land receive the reward of the suffering. Their hearts were passionate about the same things that, God, that God's heart is passionate about. Their hearts were beating in tune with God's heart. How can we have hearts that share God's passion? Well, I think that it begins with asking for it, doesn't it? I mean, have you ever prayed, Lord, give, give me your heart. Help my heart to burn with the same passion that you have, Lord. Would you fill me with the same compassion that you have for the lost? Would you fill me with the same desire to see your name glorified? Will you pray that the Lord would do that in your heart? Really, it's a dangerous prayer to pray. You never know how God might answer that and change your life. <laughs> but I want to challenge you, really, to come before God and just ask Him, Father, I want my heart to be like yours. <laughs> Secondly, let's pray to Him for the salvation of people from all the nations. I mean, that's the main point here in the first half of chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. As verse 1 says again, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. And all of this truth that we've seen today in verses 5 and 6 and 7 is just meant to, meant to persuade us to pray earnestly, to pray with devotion for the gospel to spread among all people. There are so many ways that, that you can do this. You could choose a different country to pray for every day. Just take out your map and take out your globe and choose a different place to pray for every day. You can pray specifically for the missionaries that you know, the missionaries we support as a church, and, and for the people that they're working to reach. God would open up their hearts. You can pray for lost people that you know personally. I hope that all of us would pray for unbelievers that we know to come to faith in Christ. Whatever it looks like, are you willing to be a part of what God is doing throughout the world by praying faithfully for the spread of the gospel? I think it's a wonderful privilege that we have. 
we actually get to be part of God's amazing plan by praying, by spending time with our Father in prayer and asking Him to, to release the gospel among the nations. I also want to invite you to join us at 8.15 Sunday mornings over in the North Iowa, uh, North Iowa room as we just pray there for the spread of the gospel here and around the world. Thirdly, let me just ask you to consider what else might God be calling you to do to join in his mission of reaching the lost? How would God want you to maybe reach out to the people in your neighborhood? How could you encourage and support our missionaries? Is God even calling you to go to the nations? Have you ever considered it? It's at least worth, worth asking God, isn't it? <laughs> Whatever it looks like, are you willing to follow Christ, however he might lead you, to bring the one and only message of salvation to the lost world? And then fourth, as a church here at Garner Evangelical Free Church, let's never lose sight of our calling to be a church that's always reaching out and, and looking beyond ourselves to reach people with the gospel. Let's be a church that shares God's heart. Let's be a church that keeps the Great Commission at the forefront of our ministry. Let's ask God to help us to do everything that we possibly can by His grace to win people to Christ here in Garner and throughout North Iowa and even to the ends of the earth. I think that God would be very <clears throat> pleased if we're just always praying and, and thinking about how we can introduce people to the, to the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we're just so thankful that you are, are God, our Savior, that you are our Redeemer, our Deliverer, the one who so loved the world that you gave your own Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so, Lord, help us as a church to, to proclaim that message here and to the ends of the earth. Would you help us to pray faithfully for that message of salvation to be spread throughout the world? And, Lord, we do pray even right now that you would continue to, to work in, in the hearts of lost people throughout the world and to send out laborers into your harvest field and to win millions and millions more people to faith in Christ so that you would be exalted and that countless people will come to know the joy and the hope that's found in Christ. We pray it in his saving and gracious name. Amen. We're going to transition now into the Lord's Supper. And we can come to the Lord's table because Jesus Christ is our mediator. We can only come here because of what Christ has done for us. And we call this meal that we share together communion. And we, we call it that because it's meant to be a time where we actually enjoy communion with God, where we have fellowship with God himself. Just like you have fellowship with your friends or your family members when you sit down at the table with them and you share a meal together. Really, we can think of Jesus as really being the host of this meal. And all of us are invited to his table to enjoy fellowship with our Savior at his table. All of that is only possible because Jesus, our mediator, has reconciled us to God. He's restored the, the relationship that was broken by our sin. And we're welcome now to come to the Lord, to sit down at, our table, at his table, and to have fellowship with him. And so if you know Christ as your mediator, this morning. You're welcome to enjoy this meal with us. You don't have to be a member of this particular church. You just have to be a person who's trusting in Christ for the gift of salvation. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, we ask that out of respect for you, let the elements go by. Or that even better, that in this moment, that you would receive Christ by faith and trust Him that He paid your ransom on the cross. And so as the elders come forward, let's just take a moment to, to bow before the Lord quietly and to, to prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just uh, are so thankful for salvation, Lord. And we just, as we've heard this morning and as we know, um, 
there is only one way to you, and that is through your Son. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming down to this earth to live, to be the sacrificial lamb that we could not be, to live a life that was perfect. Lord, on the one hand, we're saddened that our sin puts you on the cross. But yet, Lord, we're so thankful that you loved us so much that you were willing to lay down your life for us out of that great love that you have. So, Father, thank you for sending your Son. King Jesus, thank you for being our Savior. And as we partake in the, in the cup, Lord, we just think of your blood that was spilt and that covered our sin. And that which was dirty and ugly is now clean and white as snow. And we are stand before you righteous uh, because of that because of that gift, Lord, if we just accept it. So, Lord, we just thank you so much for... Um, for this gift, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And be thankful. Amen. Daniel, what do you think about this for us? Yeah. Lord, I'm just thinking of the sermon. Um, one God and one mediator and I thank you that you came and died and saved us and pray that we would remember that and think of those that we know who still need you as their mediator Lord and um, help us to live as a witness for you. Amen.
same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Let's pray together once again. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that you spilled your blood so that we could be brought into the new covenant, so that we could belong to you, belong to the Father, and be filled with your spirit and have a relationship with you. What an amazing thing it is that you reconciled us, and so we can call you our God and our Savior and our Lord. And so would you fill our hearts with your love in this next week, Lord, and help us to share that love with the world around us. We pray it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together as we go with God's blessing. If you'd like to pray with someone this morning, this morning there will be a prayer team available here at the front. We'd love to just spend some time with you today. So now, now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do in his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.